Hi, and welcome to Reviewing with Mrs. Wages. Today, we're going to talk about energy in living systems. Objective number one asks you to identify the ecological levels of organization. Living systems depend on order and organization to maintain life. This is true for the simplest form of life, cells, but it's also true for the complex interactions within the entire biosphere. Life requires energy to maintain organization. If you recall, cells build tissue, tissues build organs, organs build organ systems, organ systems combine to form you, the organism, and you certainly require energy to maintain your organization. Requiring energy goes well beyond the organism. The entire biosphere depends on energy input to maintain its organization as well. The organism builds populations, Populations build the communities, communities build ecosystems, those ecosystems exist within biomes, and they're all part of the big giant biosphere. All of these levels depend on energy to maintain organization. Now an ecosystem is one of those levels we just discussed. Ecosystems are composed of the biotic and the abiotic factors found there. Biotic factors are all the living things found in an ecosystem. This includes plants, animals, algae, bacteria, and other microorganisms. Wolves are very successful predators. How might they, as biotic factors, affect the success of an ecosystem? Abiotic factors are all the non-living factors found within an ecosystem. These include the average temperature, available nutrients, precipitation, and humidity, and a lot more. Abiotic factors influence the success of an ecosystem and the organisms in it. A forest fire would certainly devastate an ecosystem. Now let's consider objective number two, which asks you to explain how energy is used in biological systems. Why do we living organisms need a continuous input of energy? Well, there's three reasons. Reason number one, energy helps organisms maintain their physical organization. Our bodies are made of cells which depend on energy. These cells are organized in a way that sustains life. Remember cells equals tissue equals organs equals organ systems equals you, the organism. A continuous supply of energy is required to maintain the order and organization of life. Reason number two, energy is required by cells to drive the chemical reactions that support life. Without this input of energy, many cellular reactions would stop, resulting in the death of cells and the organism itself. No energy means no cells. No cells means no life. Reason number two continued. Glucose is an energy-storing sugar found in food. It's required for life. Without food and the energy stored in glucose, an organism would no longer be able to produce ATP. ATP supplies the usable energy that drives cellular reactions. Let's examine that more closely. We said that cells require energy to drive the chemical reactions of life. So let's look at pasta. Pasta is loaded with carbohydrates and therefore is a great source for glucose. The mitochondria in your cells, well they use that glucose to produce the molecule ATP. ATP is an energy storing molecule, usable energy as a matter of fact. And that energy from ATP is used to drive the chemical reactions that keep cells alive. And the third reason we need a continuous supply of energy because energy is required for life processes such as growth and reproduction. In fact, anything that an organism does is energy dependent. So what kind of energy are we talking about here? The vast majority of life depend on only two types of energy. And those energies are chemical energy and solar energy. Chemical energy is found in the bonds between the atoms of inorganic molecules. Solar energy comes from the sun. Those organisms that make food within their cells are known as producers or autotrophs. And some autotrophs harness solar energy from the sun. Photosynthesis is the process that allows plants and other producers to make carbohydrates like glucose. Solar energy gets converted into the chemical energy stored in glucose. Other autotrophs harness chemical energy from the bonds found in inorganic molecules. 
chemosynthesis allows certain bacteria to make glucose, their food, without light. Now consider how ecologists might analyze energy. There are three types of ecological pyramids used by ecologists to describe the flow of energy within an ecosystem. Pyramid of numbers, pyramid of biomass, and a pyramid of energy. A pyramid of numbers literally counts the number of organisms in each trophic level. Pause the video and analyze these numbers in this pyramid. And sometimes the shape of the pyramid is not a pyramid at all. Now a pyramid of biomass shows the total mass of living tissue at each trophic or feeding level. Usually each trophic level will have a greater biomass than those below it, producing the typical pyramid shape. These pyramids literally depend on the amount of flesh or living material of producers to build the shape. And perhaps the most useful ecological pyramid would be an energy pyramid. Energy pyramids show the amount of energy stored at each trophic level within an ecosystem. You can see that only about 10% of the energy gets stored in each level as you move up the pyramid. This means that about 90% of the energy that an organism gets is used for life processes or lost as heat to the environment. How does energy flow in the biosphere? The pathway is a one-way path. Energy flows in a one-way path within the biosphere. This simple food chain illustrates that one-way path. The previous energy pyramid also showed that one-way path that energy takes within the biosphere. Typically, it's from the sun to producers to consumers. Even in food webs or ecological pyramids, energy still flows in a one-way path. In this case, it's flowing upward through this food web, and it's flowing upward within this ecological energy pyramid. All right, let's flash back to taxonomy. As you recall, taxonomy is the science of classifying, naming, and identifying living organisms. King Philip Chased Old Fat Girl Scouts is a silly mnemonic device to help you remember the seven taxa of classification. And here are those seven taxa. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Outside of domain, kingdom is the broadest taxon. It would include the most organisms of these seven levels. The most specific taxon is species. This taxon includes only one kind of organism. All members of a species share the same scientific name. Scientific names are written following the rules of binomial nomenclature. This is a two-part naming system. When typing a scientific name, be sure to use italics. If you handwrite it, it should be underlined. The genus name, which is the first part, always begins with a capital letter. The second part is the descriptor, and it is always written in lowercase. Notice the example below. Felis is capitalized, and concolor is all lowercase, and the whole name is typed in italics. The more taxa the two organisms have in common, the closer their relationship. For example, in this picture, the grizzly bear and the polar bear belong to the same genus, Ursus, that tells you they have a close relationship. The panda bear belongs to a completely different genus and therefore is a much more distant relative. That's all for now. I hope this helps. And as always, happy studying!